Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will take a look at how animals make decisions. When we talk about decisions, we do not necessarily mean thinking or reflecting. We just mean that the animal could do many things, but it chooses somehow to do one. The most important idea in animal decision making in psychology is that of matching. It goes back to a 1961 paper by Richard Herrnstein and to later refinements like William Bond's paper from 1974. You can see these papers here in the lower left corner. These papers discuss animal decision making in depth, and in this lesson I will just summarize the main ideas. The idea of the matching law is simple. It just says that the time spent doing a behavior X, or the number of times you do X, are proportional to how much reward you get from doing X. Hernstein did not just make this up, but it arrived to this idea by studying data from many years of experiments on animal choice. By now it should be no surprise to learn that animal choice is studied typically in the Skinner box. You just need a Skinner box where the animal can do more than one thing. This Skinner box, for example, has two levers that the rat can press. A combination of a chain to pull and a lever to press is also common. For pigeons, people usually have two or more keys that the pigeon can pack. So let's consider a pigeon and take two actions that he can do, like pressing key 1 or key 2. If Tx is the time spent on key x and Rx is the amount of reinforcement earned from pecking at key x, then the matching law says that Tx will be proportional to Rx, as expressed in these equations. In the first equation, T1 plus T2 is the total time spent in the activities that we are considering, like pressing the two keys and R1 plus R2, the total reward earned in these activities. There could be other things that the pigeon does, but according to the matching law, we can consider just two at a time, if we wish, to simplify our analysis. The experiment just described is very similar to the one that Hernstein himself ran to test his idea. In addition, he varied the reinforcement schedule on each key, so that sometimes more food could be earned by packing key 1 and sometimes key 2 was better. These are the results from three pigeons used in Hernstein's experiment. The graph shows how much the pigeons were packing on key 1 as a function of the reward that they were getting from key 1. As you can see, the pigeons matched closely behavior with reinforcement. When only 20% of the rewards were earned by packing key 1, they packed key 1 about 20% of the time. But when key 1 was much better than key 2, they preferred to pack that one. The dashed line represents the theoretical prediction of perfect matching, and we see that overall the birds are extremely close to it. Let's see now an example of the matching law at action in nature from a field study of pied wagtails, a cute European bird that you can see in the picture. The study was conducted in a meadow near the University of Oxford by two biologists, Nick Davis, who collected the data, and Alasdair Houston, who analyzed them. At the study site, some of these birds hold a territory near the bank of the river Thames. There are many bugs along the bank, but the birds have also the option of looking for bugs in the nearby meadow. The question was, how much time do the birds spend foraging in their territory versus in the field? To see if the bird's choices conform to the matching law, Houston and Davis analyzed the data about the time spent at each location and about how many bugs each bird had captured at that location. What made the data a natural experiment on matching was that conditions change each day, so that some days it is easier to find bugs in the field and other days in the bird's territory. The question was whether the birds could adjust their behavior depending on that day's conditions. And these are the results, plotting as time spent in the field as a function of how much reward was obtained in the field. Each data point represents one day, and each color is a different bird. We can see overall that the birds could adjust their behavior pretty well, spending more time in the field on days that they could capture more bugs in the field. As in the previous graph, the dotted line represents perfect matching. We see that the data are pretty close to the dotted line, but the best fitting line is actually a bit less steep. It's the red line in the graph. This means that on average, birds prefer to spend a bit more time in their own territory than was predicted by the matching law. 
So if you take, for example, this light blue dot, that comes from a bird that was getting over 70% of its reward in the field, but was spending there only about 50% of the time. This points out that the birds might have had other reasons for spending time in their territory than just the amount of food it is found there. For example, some time in the territory is spent not foraging, but defending it from intruders. A deviation from the matching law in favor of one alternative is called bias, and it is often found when animals have some reason other than the pure amount of reward for choosing one action over another, as in the case of territories in the pied wagtail. At this point that we have seen that the matching law describes animal behavior well when they have to make decisions, you might wonder whether the matching law applies to people also. Human decision making is often more complex than that of animals, but in many cases we make split-second decisions or unconscious decisions where we don't use logical reasoning. In these cases, the matching law often applies. For example, Volmer and Bourret looked at how basketball players decide between two and three point shots. According to the matching law, players should match the number of two- and three-point shots they attempt to how many points they make for each kind of shot. Note that a three-point shot is worth one and a half times a two-point shot if successful, so the number of successful three-point shots is multiplied by 1.5 in the matching equation to calculate how much reward a player gets from three-point shots. Volmer and Bure looked at 13 male and 13 female players in a college team and followed them for a whole season. Some of the players were excluded from analysis because they made too few three-point shots or got too little playtime for a meaningful analysis. The data for the remaining 9 male and 6 female players conformed very well to the matching law, as we can see in the graph. The findings were later confirmed with professional basketball players. So even highly skilled professionals match their behavior to reinforcement in the same way that it was discovered for pigeons and rats. Let's look at another example. Conjure and Killeen asked whether we unconsciously direct our conversation to people that approve of what we say. They invited students to what looked like a discussion group on drug abuse, but in reality each student was seated with two allies of the experimenters. The allies were cued to randomly approve of what the students said. The conversations were videotaped, and later the experimenters looked at how much each student talked to the two allies. These are the results. As you can see, the talking time to alley 1 is correlated very well with how much approval the person was getting from alley 1. So, the more an alley approved of what the student said, the more the student directed his talking to that alley. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions on what to study next. The first two lessons explore some more similarities between instrumental and Pavlovian conditioning. The next two are about how animals learn more complex behavior, that is, sequences of actions rather than single actions. Happy learning to everyone!